Hi, welcome. This is Imogen with Body Intelligence, and I have a guest today, um, Miriam Grace, who's a Gestalt psychotherapist, and we have actually been friends since infant school or elementary school. <laughs> um, um, lifelong friends, very dear friends. Um, and this is the first of um, custom conversations we're going to have through April about the emotional body and her work from Gestalt and my work through the Alexander Technique. And this also relates to a workshop that we're going to be running in June called The Emotional Body. And that workshop's especially for psychotherapists, counsellors, Alexander Technique teachers, somatic practitioners of various kinds. Um, anyway, Miriam, welcome. Why don't you just like tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, we, we've been talking about this ourselves, haven't we, for quite a few years. Um, yes. I'm a Gestalt psychotherapist and I did my training 30, over 30 years ago. Um, and I'm very passionate about psychotherapy and I went to visit Imogen in America. Um, I'm from the UK and um, in 2012 and um, we just could not stop talking about our work because we we were interested in each other's different work and the more we spoke, the more we realised it seemed the same, um, although... <laughs> We were coming at it from different directions. A lot of the theory underpinnings seemed the same. And that was when um, Imogen and I began doing our body mind workshops. I think we did our first one in 2013. And this yeah. year's going to be our fourth one. Um, so um, I began my work in trauma. Um, so I'm, I'm very experienced in trauma and I've taught trauma as well. Um, but I'm also, also Gestalt is quite body based and I've had further training in somatic therapy as well. Yeah, this is really is the kind of a continued, I was going to say culmination, but a continued conversation that we're having about our own kind of passion and excitement for our own work and all these interconnections and how it relates. So today, I think you're going to tell us about the Gestalt cycle so why don't we start there what what is the gestalt cycle <laughs> right well this this is really going back to basics but um in some ways it seems really important in introducing the similarity between our work because the first workshop we did imogen we did a lot about the pause and we even printed out a pause button for participants to take home with them to remind them about the pause. Um, and it's it's this part of the cycle that's really important. So the cycle, the Gestalt cycle is sometimes called the cycle of awareness um, and it can be called the cycle of needs as well. And it's really about how we, we move through life um, in a way that meets our needs, um, but, that there's a you know there are interruptions or blocks to getting our needs met so if we take a simple need um like i'm thirsty um first of all comes nothing and an emptiness <laughs> just noticing image and drinking now <laughs> and then we have um a, a sensation and i can feel that sensation in my mouth and then the awareness is where the cognition comes in ah I'm thirsty. So this is all drawn on a cycle and I'll, I'll be putting something in the comments afterwards. So we have sensation, dry mouth, awareness, I'm thirsty, mobilisation, I reach for my water bottle, um, uh, action, contact, well, satisfaction, <laughs> withdrawal. And then we go in into a space of, of emptiness or nothingness that's sometimes called the void or the creative void. And then we're available to notice the next sensation. It might be, oh, my tummy's grumbling. Um, oh, I'm aware I'm hungry. So I go to the kitchen and I make a sandwich and I eat that and I have the satisfaction and then I leave that. So th this would mean we flow nicely and easily in life. Um, 
through our needs, um, getting our needs met. But um, as I'm sure you know, life is not that simple and uh, engagement's not that simple. Yes, what goes wrong? <laughs> what happens? <laughs> well, the, the, bit, the bit that we're focusing on today is let's have a look about what happens if we skip sensation and awareness. Now, I was listening to your talk with Shay um, about intraperception. Is that what she's calling it? Interception, which interception. is kind of awareness, awareness. of that what's aware. going on inside you. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And, and what she mentioned as a trauma survivor is, is that sometimes we learn to skip over the sensation because the sensation might be uncomfortable or it might not even really be trauma, but um, if, a, if a baby, say, isn't fed um, because it was the tradition when they were a baby to be left for four hours, um, they, they might begin to not notice hunger because it's, mm. it's, there's no point to it. Um, you know, they'll get fed when they get fed. So they start to, to not notice that sensation. So there's all sorts of reasons why we might not notice sensation or why feeling our sensation might be inconvenient so we might just skip over that and do our habit and would you say the busy lives many of us in the west live contribute to this <laughs> absolutely because we have and we'll talk about this another time but we have a lot of well we'll probably talk about this in a minute we have a lot of rules about how how we're supposed to go ahead and we respond to that more quickly and that links into um, fight or flight. But can I just give an example of why it's a bit um, difficult if we skip sensation? So if I, if I have a sensation of thirst but think I'm hungry, it doesn't matter how many sandwiches or chocolate eclairs I eat, um, I won't reach satisfaction. So it's really important that I spend time noticing the sensation and linking that to the awareness of understanding what I need. If I think, if I'm feeling lonely or sad and think I need, um, you know, food or sex or something, but actually I need a cuddle, um, you know, that, that not having spent time noticing and allowing the awareness in means that, I'm mobilising in the wrong direction to meet my needs. So before we get to the fight or flight thing, it seems like what you're talking about is pausing. And to me, and we kind of talked about this a little bit before we went on the air, it is, is the pause before the sensation? Is there some sort of stopping we've got to do to be able to notice what's going on? Um, I mean, I kind of think they can be wrapped up together, but if there was any sort of sequence, it seems to me yeah. that the pause is, and then you have some choices. And that's, yeah. you know, a big part of my work and yours. So, yeah. 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 I, I don't think anything's as simple as a, as a diagram or a gestalt cycle anyway. You know, I think that we, we don't particularly do things in order, but they're useful yeah. models. But I think that the pause we can actually begin to learn as a discipline and that might be meditation or mindfulness and that brings about the noticing um that so might be I, alexander technique yeah. <laughs> just give yes. myself a plug <laughs> so, yeah. yeah so so i think i think the, the pause makes it more likely that we will experience the sensation awareness part of the cycle so as well as the pause there's discernment for what's going on of what you do notice and being maybe more accurately able to discern like not mistaking hung thirst for hunger that's a very simple one but I can imagine mm. there's mm. all all sorts of levels of that yeah mm. Um, mm. And, and I'm thinking my work certainly will help you with that and I'm thinking that yours does too <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in, um, so, some, in some ways it appears simple because we're just we're just slowing down and noticing what is, 
um, and that and that's where this you know this paradoxical theory of change that you and I really love which um, I'll, I'll put another reference in in the comments later but this idea that we move by staying still that we change mm. by noticing and investing in what is yes yes so before we finished and I knew we would um, um, have a little bit of a, a challenge with the 10 minutes but we're, not, we're almost at the end uh, we mentioned fight or flight and I think that might be important to just hear what you have to say about that because mm. my, my thought immediately is that there's reasons why we don't pause when we when we're in mm. a fight and flight response we need to be going with our reaction before Mm. Um, um anyway tell me what yeah. you wanted yeah well, I'll, I'll say that as quickly as i can but um you know the example i use most of all is this crossing the road one um that you and i talk about so you know when when you and i approach the road you we might be in conversation but without thinking without going into cognition we look right and left it's in our body it's in our instincts and it's it's so deep we believe if we don't do this we might die and that's you know we've interjected that or we've internalized that rule um, and it's a life or death rule and and it's quite a good rule to have on the whole I mean still look right and left even if it's a one-way street or closed yeah um, but it's really I think that's really empowering to know that mm. we have learned to pause and we don't even we do stop and look, but we don't have to. Um, there's no challenge mentally to doing that. We it just happens at some point. But whereas when we were little children, it didn't just happen. So. But that's a pause that's geared to our fight, flight, our survival need, and we absorb a lot of other rules as children, and our, we don't know the difference between mm. um, one of the early exercises I get my clients to do usually is to list their introjects and um, somebody mentioned this week about putting your elbows on the table and how you must not put your elbows on the table. I'm doing this now and, and I haven't died as a result but um, the first time you do it um, there will be an element of fear because you're breaking a survival rule that you've been given and it feels as dangerous as standing on the edge of a cliff um, so part of therapy, going through and working out, um, you know, I, some of my interjects are get on with it and don't give up and don't stop. And we were talking about being busy. So I can rush to that as a survival need. I'm thinking about the safety and survival things that we've had to learn to do differently over the last year. Yeah. And then as things hopefully get safer mm. how that will come out as, as we then break a rule that we made yes. to keep us safer um yeah. yeah anyway we don't need to get into that but i can really see how there's a yes. lot in this yes well i think yeah. that's that's why we're spending with our workshop is four sessions isn't it and the third session is going to be very much about that and we will be examining how we internalize rules and how they both keep us safe but if we don't bring awareness to them we you know we can end up obeying those rules long after they're useful mm. yeah so again it comes down to the pause to awareness pause um, and say some yeah. awareness yeah. Yeah. Mm. so um just a quickly i'm just thinking about our workshop and yeah. in the past these have happened when i've visited you in the uk mm -hmm. we've done a couple in derby and we did one in nottingham mm -hmm. um but this year it's going online and instead of being a one day sort of intensive it's over four weeks in june so there'll mm -hmm. be four 90 minute sessions and i think in some ways it will offer a different depth um yes, the thing. Yeah. so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it mm. um so we have a topic for our next 
10 to 15 minute conversation um, which is is safety achieved in the body or in the mind something yeah. along those lines anyway so that's just to yeah so hopefully you will tune in um, next week when we talk about that if um you're new to my work I'll drop my website into the comments and you can sign up for my mailing list I have a nice little um gift seven tips to reduce stress in the moment um mm. and if you're not familiar with Miriam's work you can, she'll drop her information and you can sign up for her but whoever you uh, if you're interested in possibly um doing our workshop you'll keep informed that way too so yeah. um I think there's anything I've forgotten Miriam <laughs> I just wanted to add in that they you know we love doing experiential exercises for practitioners um that they can take back to use with their clients and use for their self-awareness so um these conversations are of the theory um but the workshop is very much um you know sort of experience yes. and and you know yeah and interactive and and fun and we won't be always glued to the to the screen we'll be learning to be relaxed within the workshop as well so yeah, absolutely yes all right so yes. thanks miriam and I'll see you we'll, next week <laughs> we'll be back anyone has any questions just pop them in the comments and we'll get back to you afterwards so all right bye, bye. <laughs>